This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning and good morning. Good morning again, and let's try that one more time. Apologies for any signal breakup we might have had. Good morning, everybody. My name is Steve, joined by BK Camera, and we are very excited to have you here with us live once again. Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands, and uh, we'd love to hear from you using hashtag Wild Earth YouTube chat stream or throw your questions and comments in on Twitch. It is the final day of the birding challenge between uh, Noel and myself. We have got an hour and a half. To accumulate as many birds as you can. We're starting off this morning on an even 51-51 according to um, file controls list. Uh, apparently there's a few other lists doing the rounds on online but uh, the rules stated have to be seen on the camera. So if there's any de debates or de doubts about some birds that have been seen and not identified on camera, well they don't count. So Noel is going to be out this morning on bushwalk once it lightens up. It is a very nice 19 degrees Celsius, 66 degrees Fahrenheit. And well, we had Shadulu just here yesterday. And we followed her all the way to the junction of Balanati's and Rebecca's along here last night. And then we left her in a pile of buffalo poo, which she was rather enjoying last night. So we're just going to see if if we can figure out where she's gotten to and then I'm gonna get my bird on yeah so we were following her and uh, she crouched out at one point we thought okay what's she doing and then obviously out of the bush came a hyena and then out of the bush came another three hyenas and then there were suddenly five of them following her these Juma, this Juma clan that's what they do they follow our leopards around in hope of a Snacking, snatching a meal. Mm, no, Graham, it is dark. Uh, there's no, it's very heavy cloud. It's not rain cloud, it's just this, um, this front has hit us the last four days and it's just thick, thick sort of hanging cloud. And um, no, I don't think it's going to rain, but I've been wrong before. So let's just try to catch up some speed. We are a few hours behind her. The way she was moving, I was almost certain she was going to cross straight out, but then she did a surprising little left turn. Okay, there's her tracks heading in that direction. We followed her from here. And the buffalo herd kind of came onto this road and then went straight south. Oh, Sarah, you'd like to see Tingana. Okay. Well, I will um I will put that on the list of things to see this morning. He was in Bufusuk last I heard. And of course there's always the possibility he'll be out. And uh, no one spoke of him last night on the radio. So we'll do a big loop, see where Shadulu's gotten to, and then I'll do a loop back into Juma with the intention of there we go.
Sorry about that, everybody. I have no idea what is transpiring with our signal. Maybe we've surrounded by buffalo. Now I'm I'm thinking this might be a different herd or the herd that came through here. But I turned back. Look at the little ones. There's a lot of little babies all of a sudden in these herds. It might be that one herd's following another, but that's unlikely. It doesn't seem to be that big of a herd, but it might be spread all the way across. They're looking at us in the early morning going, what do you want? This is common practice for buffalo at this time of day to be bedding down. Having fed late at night, been ruminating for a while. The most active periods are sort of early morning and then later afternoon. Uh, it's been a fair bit of the evening just relaxing. But they can walk, they can cover distance, and they can evade predation at night. And that's often what causes them to move some vast distances. So maybe if this is the same herd, they encountered lions when they went towards the south, and then that caused them to turn back. Might be a second herd entirely. Yes, they are very cute. Look at that little thing there. <laughs> well, they do look just like baby cows. Well, they're not too far away, to be honest. You know, I mean, they are all related. They're just very well adapted on the African landscape, and they are not domesticatable. You get certain animals that are just not domesticatable, and then you get others that are. And the, the cow that we see today domesticated around the world is one of those that was found in, probably in Europe, early, early sort of civilizations, same as a specific type of chicken and a specific type of horse. And those were found to, to be able to be broken in, in, in as it were, and utilized by man to carry out many of the deeds that the plants that we found to or that domesticated us we found that a cattle cattle or horse was easier at disturbing or grading the land plowing the land that uh, we now utilize for all year round growing a food i was talking yesterday about the hunter gatherer lifestyle about how bands of homo Hominids used to walk around the landscape and move in seasonal sort of distribution of food and in small bands because the food supply wasn't huge and then once upon a time a group of hominids probably stayed in an area longer than normal and wheat or grain or whatever it was that they'd been cleaning started growing at one of the ponds or puddles that maybe they'd been utilizing and they thought oh this is interesting our favorite food that we travel all over to try and find is growing right here where we are comfortable in sitting. And so began the domestication of man. They say we domesticated plants and animals, but plants domesticated people. Because what does domesticate mean? Domos is to live inside a house. And so the plant made us stay in one place, tend to their every need, tend to the weeding, to the watering, to the nutrification. And what happened eventually is we started growing crops and supporting larger groups of people and we started staying in one place, not moving. And what that started doing is putting pressure on the landscape. Seasonality still occurred, crops failed, plagues arose, rodents spread disease. And so civilization with all of its interesting bits and pieces was formed and obviously the weak would die, spread around with disease and the strong would survive. But our movements across the landscape were curtailed in what's called the agricultural revolution. 
10, 12,000 years ago. And it's interesting because around the world, sort of in Central America, sort of Central um, North, North Central Africa, and then sort of Persian area, all those dates predating sort of Persian times, uh, civilizations of people that rose up at the exact same time and agricultural evolution started with them all pretty much at the exact same time in completely remote parts of the world. People who'd never seen each other before, interacted with each other before, had no connection with each other whatsoever, managed to domesticate similar plants and with them similar animals. Sort of that sort of central belt across the world. Everything further north and south of that wasn't domesticatable. And slowly as people move through the landscape they start changing everything. And so with the cattle. Exactly, Jenny. It's that misnomer that we domesticated it. No, wheat and grain, which is probably a very, very small percentage of the world's population of plants at the time, is now the most widely cultivated plants on the planet. On the planet. And people broke their backs to cultivate them. We were never designed to pull a plow or spend all day bending over, digging. If you're designed for walking long distance, carrying our worldly possessions in, in our bag, on our back, with a house came the ability to collect more things. Then we developed a bigger house, a garage, and then a storeroom, and more things, and more things. And so led to the human attachment of so many unnecessary objects in our life. That's why I, I like to move around a lot. Everything I own fits into my car. Three or four years in a place and I move and then I get rid of a lot of stuff again. Unburden myself of unnecessary gear and equipment. Well, there's a buffalo. I've got no gear, no equipment. They sleep where they, where they lay. They eat what they find. And they drink regularly. So this is what we call bedding down. Yeah, they've got no strings attached. They can leave everything behind. Uh, I, I wish I'd been born in those days when we were slave to the landscape and to the weather and we moved with it. When the weather was uncomfortable we migrated. When the food sources diminished we moved. Everyone in those days was expert at everything. Hunting, fishing, leather work, rope work, medicinal plant gathering, healing. Everybody knew their part. They all did it for themselves. Obviously some people were better than other things than each other. But slowly a civilization formed and we got more and more and more people. People started to specialize. And obviously... If I wanted boots, I could go and trade someone meat or apples for boots. And slowly but surely over time, the guy who had the boots didn't want my apples anymore, but he wanted uh, cherries instead or a shirt. And that is how money was first formed. That's why um, in those days, early sort of emperors or kings or whatever it was in those societies would put their mark on money. And that declared that that money was real. That's why today still counterfeit forgeries with the regard to currency are so highly, highly punishable. Because it's essentially you are you're going against the name and word of the emperor or king of the time. So just forging a few notes or whatever it might be. You're essentially taking the king's name in vain. And that was punishable by extreme measures back in the day. And it still carries on today. Money. A senseless object really, but the only reason it has any power over us is because we all believe in it. We all believe in money. 
We believe that if I give you a hundred dollars, you're going to accept it as the value of a hundred dollars. Took a very long time for that to be established. There was a time when people used cowrie shells as a form of currency. There was a time when they used barley in weight. But there was only so much barley you could deal with. Eventually they needed something smaller. Taxes be trundled around on cartloads. You couldn't go and get barley. A coin was then formed and weighted specifically. And then because it had the stamp of uh, a certain individual, it was then recognized by everybody as being of a certain value. Slowly but surely, those precious items, namely gold, became international. Mm, and now we walk around with virtual money and we swipe a card that apparently says you've got money. Numbers on a computer screen somewhere say you've got money. <laughs> and then people give you things. It's quite incredible, isn't it? Imagine one of these buffalo coming up to you with a card and saying, can I have something? You'd be like, what? You've got no credit. <laughs> Where's your money? They don't need it. Back in a simple time when everything you could find was in and around you. Yeah, lady, I think I do owe them money. They definitely are behaving as if I owe them a lot of money. But unfortunately, everybody, we are stuck right here. We can't go anywhere. Now, in the road, this is the toll gate, the Buffalo toll gate. Mm. Okay, I've seen they know that we're here. Um, the buffalo get quite relaxed to vehicles. Obviously, if I drive too close, it'll cause them to move off. Um, we arrived in the darkness. Some of them stood up. And we've held off a bit of space, and we're just sitting here, and they've all just gone back to relaxing. They don't see it as a road or as a means of us trying to get past. They just look at us going, okay, there's one of those funny green things that smells of fuel watching us again. They're not threatened at all. But if we drove closer, that would cause them to move. If you don't really want to do. Birding challenge can wait for the light to improve. And we're going to go to I, out of IR in a moment, Meg, whenever you're ready. Okay. Three, two, one. Boom. Look at that magic trick. Full of tricks this morning. Okay. Top not yeah, they don't have one mate shark. They've got a group of sort of dominant females that sort of leads the way. And uh, in many records, they go and show that you'll get a group of females that will sort of lie down and face a specific direction. Um, and then once they stand up, those females will start moving in that exact direction. And uh, generally older, more experienced females in the herd, those in good condition, um, and they've got a higher rank. And they're essentially the leaders of the, of the herd, and where they go, they go in response to the needs of the herd, and they try not to go over the same paths. They try to move in response to where the vegetation is at its best, and so you'll sort of get these figure of eights to and from water points figure of eights changing in shape and dynamics and, and range uh, depending on where the food is so they're moving these arcs to and from water and they try not to go along the exact same path uh, twice obviously that's not always possible but they'll always spread out slightly and that's how they sort of effectively keep that or mow the lawn down and facilitate opening it up but at this, at this time, there's so much food available that they can afford to be a little bit closer. But they 
constant fear of lions chasing them. You couldn't see it on their face, could you? They don't look like they're being constantly harassed by lions. It's just part and parcel of their day. They're so used to it. They were born running from lions and they will die running from lions. What a little fellow. I'm sure it's realized what a lion is by now. <laughs> I'm all ears and a nose. Sally, they're basically ruminating. So the sideways chewing is how you chew your food. It's just that's the way they uh, chew the food. The big molars on the top and bottom. And uh, it's just the way that the, the jaw moves. It's not an upward and down movement. The grazers have got flat teeth. So they basically need to grind the food if you ever ground something, say I, I took a stone, I might need to demonstrate this on the dashboard here, PK. If, if you've got a grinding stone, this is the grinding stone and this is the grinding surface at the bottom here, and I just tried to grind things like this, it'd be very, very slow going, but if I grind it like that, which is what we do, then you grind things, two flat surfaces essentially grinding, doing this we can do it because our teeth are essentially designed for breaking and crushing food in that certain way. But have a look when you really get into chewing something. You really start the sideways motion. Your jaw gets quite sore of foods that are very hard and tough because we're designed to cook food so it's much softer, much easier for us to chew. These guys are chewing and chewing and chewing grasses that um, an up and downward motion isn't really going to break it, but a sideways grinding motion across those molars is essentially the grinding process. And enormous amounts of saliva being processed there to surround those food particles that get that get chewed up and churned up and then swallowed. And then those bacteria microorganisms in the saliva is what actually does the breaking down of the food in the gut. So Browsers have got much more sort of diamond shaped teeth because they need to cut the leaves. The cutting of the leaves works much better than the grinding of the leaves. And your mixed feeders have got a mixture between sort of diamond shape and flat. You see warthog teeth, they're very flat. Elephants though have got very strange teeth, but then they're, they're very flat as well, but they don't very they don't do much breakdown at all. The chewing really is just a sort of process of just breaking things up slightly. But this sideways chewing churns that those particles up to very, very fine consistency, which increases their surface area, which then allows for far more increased bacterial breakdown. Siberia, you want to know how long it takes them to develop the skill? Well, it just happens, really. Like, you'll see these little youngsters are sitting on the ground. They're too young to be ruminating. Uh, they haven't yet um, managed to get any uh, vegetation. It's relying on milk. So you can see it sits in there and it's sleeping. But we noticed the wildebeest, after the first month, they were already chewing the grass and they're already ruminating. It's such an automatic response. They just know what to do, it's that little fella. Once he's got a belly full of, uh, full of grass, he'll go through the rumination process. But right now it's all milk and there's no need to re-chew. It's just a belly full of milk and he can have a nice little sleep. Remember when they're ruminating, their brain 
capacity is at the level of a sleeping animal, truly Zen meditating animal, and tucking their legs up underneath them, their bodies at rest. Have you ever <clears throat> sat next to someone chewing chewing gum? Well, it sounds similar to that. Very, very methodical. Probably maybe not as annoying as someone chewing chewing gum, because people who chew chewing gum don't chew it at exactly the same pace. A rumination, ruminating animal, it's, it's a very steady one, two, three, Four, five. <laughs> Look at the muscles on the side of the head there. Enormous amount of muscles to activate that jaw all the time. The ox peckers have found them. They still need to get a red bulldog, a yellow bulldog picker. to start my car. They're looking so relaxed, aren't they, Beaks? So yeah. chilled and relaxed. Well, everybody, the buffalo are officially back on Juma. It's a positive sign. It's not a... It's not the... the it's a little bit of a... You know, it's an interesting one for bushwalking, having buffalo around as much because not only does it make the walks a little bit more sort of dangerous or curious, but also the ticks that the buffalo are going to bring with them are going to really start gnawing at little bits of us bushwalkers. To date I've only had a few in the last few weeks, but this is a smorgasbord of fresh tick activity right there. And as Megan says in my ear, now where are the lions? Well, that's a very good point. Kuhumas, where are you? There's an ox picker straight there, Beaks. Let's see which one he is. We've got one standing up right there. There's one has got underneath his belly there. There's one on his back leg. Can you see it? Oh. oh, they're both red built. Laid her. Have you seen how BK? Well, you haven't really seen BK moving, but you might see the camera shake from time to time. And I swat myself all the time. The flies are manic. And the buffalo smell far worse than we do. So they are completely at the mercy of the flies. They're biting flies and they're constantly going for the eyes and the soft bits of the animals around the bottom and the anus and around the eyes. So the flies are basically just flicking and swatting. No, the ears, sorry, are flicking and swatting the flies that are trying to land on them. You can actually see how many flies are flying around its head. Another reason why buffalo are so prone to covering themselves in mud has a very nice cooling element, but it also prevents the biting flies from getting access to certain parts. There we go, Donna. Already started. This fellow's for a few weeks old, month maybe at the most. And the horns already starting to pop out of the head there. Just a small little bit starting. So most of the babies will be born December, January, February. 
maybe some, most of them probably, oh, there's ox pecker just above. Please be a yellow bulb. No, it's a red bulb. Most of the babies would have been born January, March. We didn't see too, too many, or oh, February, sorry. We didn't see too many babies in buffalo herds in December. He's having a proper snooze. Okay, well, we've spent half an hour sitting out these buffalo. It sounds like bushwalk team is out and about. We've got one hour till the bird challenge ends. So let's send you over to the bushwalk team. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We have one hour left of the bird challenge, Steve. I'm super excited. I was hoping maybe you'd get some light jars. Sadly, that didn't happen, but you're at 52 and I'm at 51 and we have one hour left, everybody. Good morning, I'm Noelle Van Moden and we have Owen on camera. And of course we've got Moen, um, Moen. Moen is Morris and Owen stuck together, by the way. We've got Morris down here. So one hour left in the bird challenge. Steve is one bird up. Now I have a sneaky suspicion my friend Steve is gonna go to Chitwa Chitwa. And I was actually gonna walk there this morning as well. However, this is our sky. That is some heavy sky. So, and also over here as well. So the chances that we might get some precip precipitation is good. I think I need more coffee this morning, everybody. So we're actually not gonna walk that far, but we're gonna work the area that we have. So we're gonna go to Little Pans. We might go to the dam. We're gonna go in the drainage system and we're gonna do our best. My goal is to try and get 10 birds this hour. And we'll see what, what we can do. However, with the heavy humidity and the possible precipitation, it's actually quite quiet this morning for birds. Very similar to how it was for us yesterday afternoon towards the end of our bushwalk. I also want to wish everyone a very, very happy World Wildlife Day. And as I say that, I can hear a Lavellan's cuckoo. It used to be called a striped cuckoo. We'll see if we can go and find, find that striped cuckoo. That's not on our list yet. So happy World Wildlife Day. Um, I just want to put out there a little thought for everybody on this day. If we were to remove all the wildlife from our life, the spaces that we live in and operate in wouldn't be able to exist. If we remove ourselves from where all the wildlife is, the wildlife would carry on. Just want you guys to think about that. Because when we're talking about conserving wildlife, World Wildlife Day, we're talking about conserving species and spaces, spaces Somewhat for their benefit, but it's really for us. All right. And that's okay for it to be for us, but we need to recognize why we're doing things. So we're just on the edge of quarantine, the northern edge of quarantine. Steve's down that side with his buffalo. Morris and I were chatting just now. Where there's buffalo, there normally should be lions. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to cut across like this and see if we can pick up anything on lions while we're busy birding. And we're gonna be checking out small little bushes like this. We need fire finches, wax bills. There's a few cuckoo species that we haven't managed to get on camera yet. And also keeping our eyes open for any of our possible leopardesses that are in the area. Now, I believe some of you really wanna see Tingana. Depending on where we get this morning, Tingana was last seen in Biffleshook, which is to our north. Not too far from where we are right now. So if he starts moving south, we managed to pick up on his tracks. That is a definite possibility. Now, I'm curious to know how all of you are celebrating World Wildlife Day. Are you doing anything special? Any plans? Uh, we have some doves, but we have most of our doves. We actually haven't gotten a red-eyed dove. Camera, interesting enough. I'm actually just looking here at this little watery patch. This would be perfect for some wax bills or some fire finches. They can go into the vegetation. Oh, 
Christine, so true. Christine saying that she would not want to live in a world without animals. I also wouldn't want to live in a world without animals. I was thinking about this morning when I was scrolling through my images about what I felt like sharing, and I found an image of an armored ground cricket. Now, for some people, they go, oh, insects, but we actually couldn't be around here without insects. And armored ground crickets are a little bit gnarly looking, but yes, they're amazing. They come out after heavy rains in more arid areas, or even around in the area that we're in now. And they look, if you've ever seen the movie District 9, they look like those creatures from, from District 9, which is interestingly enough because District 9 was made in South Africa. And those species occur in Southern Africa. So maybe, maybe the director had seen that from time to time. We've got a woodland kingfisher. It's already on our list, but it's a beautiful view just through the top of the tree there. LB, Chrissy, you're asking what, what, what bird book and butterfly book? Oh, <laughs> sorry, LB, Chrissy, you're saying you're actually going to go out and buy a, a, a butterfly book and a bird book for World Wildlife Day. That's fantastic. Yes, please do that. That's a great thing to do. If any of you have any of the streaming platforms, um, I know Attenborough put out a nice new version of Our Planet. There's a, another new one that came out, um, I think it's called Night on Earth, which I haven't seen yet. That might be something that I do for World Wildlife Day, but I'm also very lucky. I get to be out and about in nature on World Wildlife Day, watching things like this beautiful woodland kingfisher. Ah, Steve has another bird. Of course you do, Steve. Go on to Steve to number 53 while we try and find you a few of our own. Okay, well, we've got a bed, but I don't know what it is. Can't quite tell from here. Oh, he's doing some wonderful movements. It looks like a grey-headed sparrow by the way it's moving. Yeah, grey-headed sparrow, we've really got one of them. Now, we've come out towards where we left Chidulu last night, and the herd of buffalo has gone back over their tracks, so it is the same herd that moved through and they came probably probably bedding down in this open area over here and they gone back so her tracks have been completely eradicated so we're going to go down here and have a look um what's forced them them to go back is a good question did they go drink a treehouse dam and then come back again i'm not sure so let's just have a look it's also possible so all over, all over, all over. Buffalo went all the way down here and all the way back. So let's see if there's any lions that have followed them in. In the meantime, who else got a bird of that? We do, we do. It's a rattling cysticula. Now, we don't have that checked off on our list yet. We haven't been able to get it on camera. One of our more common birds and one of our more common cysticulas in this area. Sitting on top of his little perch and chirp, chirp, chirping away. He's got quite a large lexicon of calls, but very distinctive rattling. And then you can see when he's moving around, he's got a slight flick to his tail. We'll listen to him for a moment. He's, of course, quieted down just slightly as we're busy with all of you. Excellent little bird to add to our list. Sounds like Steve's number 53 turned out to not to be a 53 because it was a gray-headed sparrow. I think both of us have the gray-headed sparrow. Thank you, little rattling cysticula. I think one of the other birds we'll be aiming for as we walk around in the more wet areas would be a red-faced cysticula. We've seen them a little bit, but we haven't gotten them on camera quite yet. And then also a yellow-billed oxpecker. Oh, sorry. I think it's actually Steve's on 51 and I'm on 52. Megs, did Steve not get a bird this morning? Another one. <gasps> oh, we're winning, everybody. We're winning. Oh, oh, uh oh. I'm, I'm competitive, but my friend Steve is uber competitive, so I think I'm actually poking the bear a little bit here. That's okay. I've got the prize in my pocket. I'll show you guys the prize. So Morris made this prize the other day. 
This is the anklet prize that will be worn by one of us. I'm really excited about it. Morris is smiling in the back. We will both love it. All right, come, let's keep stalking some birds. Now, Steve says he's also gonna start looking for some lions. I wonder if my friend is taking pity on me that we won't be walking to Chitwa and he himself has decided not to go to Chitwa. But again, I don't want to poke the bear. Ooh, Louise, really great question. So Louise is asking what's better for birding, driving or walking. So Louise, when you're walking and you're moving slowly like we are, you can really inhabit a habitat and knock off a lot of birds. But if you're trying to do what Steve and I are doing, which is to have a large number of birds all at once, it's actually sometimes better to drive because then you can get to different habitats, if that makes sense. Sorry, Morris is pointing something out. Do you hear something? Ooh, hyena. Ah, there's hyena calling from up in the northwestern corner of our traverse, right close to Sydney's dam. That's where we think the lions might be coming out of, possibly, just a thought. We're actually heading up in that way. So I think it depends on what's happening in your life with walking or, or driving, but for big birding day, definitely driving around. Now let's head on over to Steve, who has a bird. Emerald spotted wood dove. There we go. What a beautiful fellow. And I'm just going to turn around quickly because we've got a golden tail woodpecker behind us in this tree. I just heard him. Just send your camera up there, Beaks. You'll find him. Oh, he's off to another tree now. I just heard him again. Golden tail woodpecker opening the chest of gold. <laughs> Maybe he'll come back. Maybe he'll come back. There's some hornbills up there, some yellow bills. Been asked to find a ground hornbill. That should be one of the birds that tops the list. I'm going to play the call. Maybe we'll be lucky and it'll come back. Very nice sound, isn't it? Very easy to differentiate the woodpeckers by their different calls. There we go. Beaks. There we go. Two of them. Down. There we go. Right there. Yay! There's the two golden tail woodpeckers. Fantastic. See a little streaky chest? And they heard me. <laughs> they heard me. They're like, what? Where is that coming from? Actually looks like two males. Let's see if there's a bit of black on the forehead of one of them. A female's got the black spots on the forehead and the little black sort of mustachial stripe. And the males got a red and a red moustache you'll strike. Very cool to see. And what's that on the top right, BK? That little fellow. Oh. Looks like a streaky headed seed eater, but I'm not certain. No, not a seed eater. Looks like a Petronia, but I'm not certain. Looks like a yellow throated Petronia. Have a look closely. Can we get the yellow spots on the throat? The white eye stripe. Looks like there's a yellow spot in the throat, does it not? Now, I'm going to play the call. Sometimes they respond.
He's not bothered. <laughs> not concerned. Very rapid. Makes it easy to identify, but he's not responding. It looks like a Petronia to me, but there's so many little birds that have these similar characteristics. I wonder if any of you out there are able to have a better ID than me. I've got such a small screen here to look at. Calling there, fella. Okay, well, it looks like a petronia. I'm not certain in this light. They've got a very characteristic yellow spot on the throat with a broad white eyebrow. So, any good girl agrees with me, I can show you a picture, everybody, and you can see what I'm looking at. It's a very nice photo of the yellow throated Petronia. And you don't easily see the yellow, yellow spot in this fellow. There we go, it's a little bit easier to see. But if you have a look at the drawing, the drawing looks just like that one, but sometimes it's hard. I'm quite keen to go for that, but I'll wait for anyone else's judgment to see if we are happy as well with that ID. Thanks, Beaks. can't be winning with uncertainty, can we? It has to be certain. Yellow-throated Petronia, potentially. They like to sit up top of the tree like that. They're not responding to my call. Oh, BK, we got some... Looks like some vultures over there. That'll be quite nice. I don't have any vultures yet. Oh, yes. White-back vultures. And see if they're all white backs. Shall we? That one on the top, definitely. That one on the left, unsure. Let's go down to the right beaks. Down to the right. There we go. There's a white back. Let's go a bit closer. Let's double check. There might be a hooded vulture in there, which should be quite useful. I think they're all three white backs, but from this distance, it's hard to be certain. I'll take an extra bird for a little extra drive. Oh, here's a wax fill with a bit of grass, BK, just in the bush here. Left, there we go, left, left, up, middle. He's got a little bit of grass in his beak, he flew in there. He's going to build a nest or to show a lady how good at building a nest he is. Sweep, sweep, sweep. Okay, well, we're going to try and figure this out and send you back over to Noelle with another bird. We've got a black-headed oriole that keeps flying around. We're going to try and get him to you on camera. Nope, he's here, Owen, in this green, green, green tree. Yep. No, 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 go in here. That one. Yeah. Now go. Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to find for you. Oh, he's now back in the dead tree over here, Owen. Just at the top, he's mixing in with the weavers. Black-headed oriole is the one in the middle, the middle branch. Up, go up. Go left. And, um, there's weavers mixed in there. Just want to triple confirm we've got the right one. He's chasing them around. 
Oh, no, they've flown off into the back. All right, viewers, you guys are going to have to call it. There was weavers mixed in there. The black-headed Oriole had the very, very, very black head. He's now at the back, just in that tall, tall tree where we were trying to show you earlier. He's chasing some weavers around, and he's very active in his calling. Megs did a really great version of his call yesterday. The, <laughs> I'm going to repeat it. Sorry, Megs. <laughs> I can see him with my binos. Which tree? The skinny drunk tall no, one. not the skinny tall one. The the big thick thick one. He's up at the top, towards the back. I don't know if we're gonna manage him on camera again. Oop! What are you right there? Here we go. They're back. The other two are back. No, Just here yeah. in this dead tree on the right hand side. Perfect. Let's just triple check. There we go, guys. That was the black-headed Orioles there. And then one's flying right over our head. He there he's going. He's just up in there. Do you have him there? Black, black-headed black Oriole, everybody. We're calling that one. Now let's quickly go over to Steve, who has a bird. Mm, well done. We've got a ground scraper thrush here, which is a nice one to see. They always characteristic stand on top of a tree like this. Uh, they often find them on the ground, but in the late afternoon or early morning, they often have them perched right on top of the tree. They make all sorts of whistling sounds. They do the sort of run and stand up straight, run and stand up straight, not hopping. Oh, and there's a fork tail drongo friend. Hello, friend. We've got four keys. So those were both, um, or all three, were white back vultures. Very good. Ground scraper thrush is that one bird that you shouldn't confuse with anybody else. Very good. Let's keep going. This area here always had some Senegal lapwings, it's not overgrown. No problem, no one's yet confirmed the Petronia. I'm almost certain, but I'm not 100%. Not 100%. If I'd heard him call, I would have been more inclined to just go, yes! But, we're not going to win with a bird like that. Excuse me one second. So strong. Engage your inner elephant. Ooh, 37 minutes. <laughs> 37 minutes until we tally our scores. Jim, we do. We get the brown headed parrot here, which I find extremely hard to get on camera. And then in the north, we also get. Um, gray-headed parrot as well as the mayor's parrot and down in the south we get the cape parrot so those are four parrot species the mayors and the brown-headed are able to hybridize I've been told and the gray-headed is very big it's actually quite closely related to the cape the big parrots we find them in the northern Kruger Makoleki Pufuri, only place I've seen them in South Africa. The mayors are there as well. We've got a starling BK. So hopefully the light is good enough on this guy to identify him. Yes, that is a Cape Glossy starling. Very good. 
finally got some light and and he's making the noise so cape glossy starling and we're going to send you over to Noel who's got another bird herself Hi everyone, I'm not quite sure if we've knocked off the blacksmith lapwing on our list so we're just going to show it to you, you guys can let me know and then I just wanted to just explain to you with those last orioles that we saw, there weren't other weavers that were in there. It was, I was mistaken, it was juveniles, which we figured out after we were watching them a bit. So it was mom and dad and three or four juveniles that were all fly, flying around, which is actually pretty fun and amazing. We were watching them in the tree and then there was a fork-tailed drongo that was trying to get into the mix as well. It was a lovely little sighting. Now these blacksmith lapwing have obviously seen us Oh, yay, we didn't have it on our list, but now we do. So these blacksmith lapwing are busy seeing us and busy alarm calling for us. I'm just going to go a little bit quiet so you can hear them. So I think you guys can hear a teeny little bit. So the name blacksmith lapwing supposedly comes from the sound that they're making, where it sounds like a blacksmith that's hitting an anvil onto metal. That's what they tell me. That tink, 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 tink. And you find them always near water or what was a water source. So we're going to keep moving on closer to this area where they are. Maybe we'll see if we can find you some bird tracks. Here they come. Maybe we find their eggs as well. I'm pretty sure you could hear them then. And obviously just very careful where we step and checking the small shrubs and trees around this little watering hole as we do so for any possible bird species. You were asking about parrots. Here they come. They're not happy about us being here. You were asking about parrots earlier. In this area where we're going to walk now by the river, we have brown-headed parrots. So we're definitely gonna try and get those on camera for you. Now just very carefully checking. If we can find their eggs to show you, I'll be super excited. They're tiny, tiny, tiny. And they would have put them somewhere like here near this log with a little bit of a scrape or over here by this elephant dung. We are, in fact, by Galago Pan Megs. Astutely deduced, my friend. But no, I'm not, see I'm not seeing any eggs to show you. Now, um, some of you were saying more comments about what you are doing for World Wildlife Day. And there was a viewer that sent through a comment that she and her husband will be drawing uh, wildlife. Laura Lee, you'll be drawing some wildlife for World Wildlife Day. That's fantastic. I hope you're a better artist than I am. I once tried in the tent to draw Africa for everybody and make a map. And I think, <laughs> I think it ended up looking like a sock. Not a very good, <laughs> very good artist. So I, I wish you better than, than myself. And then I've got some really great personal news for me but it could be for for other people as well so one of the reserves that's very near and dear to my heart is Medikwe game reserve in the northern side of north central side of south africa and for many many years they've been part of the ewt cheetah meta population relocation and one of the female cheetahs who's been on the property for a few years has had her first successful litter, let's call it. She tried last year to have babies, but she was attacked by a spotted hyena. And in the attack, she aborted and ate her babies. And I just found out that two days ago, three days ago, maybe more or less, she was found. And she's got four tiny, tiny little cubs. They're uber cute. So hopefully if they survive, the meta population of cheetahs will get larger, which is super exciting. Now Steve has a very large pachyderm that he would like to postulate about. Hmm, we just had a common cuckoo that sat around for long enough. <laughs> but not long enough. <laughs> we found a nice little herd of ellies. Big elephant bull. 
following this group. There he is. Look at him. And this is the little pan at the end of Shibamo Road, right by the old Juma Den. This is the summer residence of the Juma Den from last year. And this is the pan I saw a moor hen the other day. I was hoping to maybe try and catch up with it. But James Richard, thank you for coming back and confirming that that was a yellow-throated petronia. Very nice to get some feedback from the from the viewers. Maybe these Elliots will chase the moor hen out. Look at these elephants sticking their trunks in his mouth. They're saying, look, smell me. Incessant without her trunk in his mouth. The calf did it as well just before. Look at that. Okay, now the calf's trunk is in again. Smell me, big fellow. Elephants do to greet each other. They'll take their trunks and blow into the mouth of the other. Now something's going on. Is this a friendly love tap? Looks like it. Oh, jabbed him. Now let's see how he behaves with the other female. He's going to probably stick his, uh, his trunk between her legs. Yeah. He smelt some estrus females, he's come looking for them. I think that was the, the other female before was making him smell again. It's not me, not me. <laughs> now he's sauntering off, not interested in this herd anymore. No one in estrus here. There's a small little drink. The boy goes off one way, and the rest of the family the other way. They're going to come right past us. And off. There you go. Okay, well, we're going to make our way around to Treehouse Dam real quick. And then <laughs> zooming off from there, we might attempt to get to Chitwa, but at the moment we're in the lead, so I'm not going to, not going to go to Chitwa if, if we don't need to. <laughs> well, we might. We might. And Noel is quite upset with me if I go to Chitwa. So we're likely to get a number of birds if we go there. Natalie, I reckon, I think it's about 10 litres um, for a big elephant. Uh, but, and then obviously the smaller you are, the smaller the trunk is. I think it's around there. So what's that? Is that about a gallon? I'm not sure the conversion of, of litres to gallons. Oh, that common cuckoo would have been, a, would have been an awesome one. Anyway, I've only got two of them on camera since I've worked here. <laughs> so that would have been the third. Grey-headed sparrows flitting about. Oh, Noelle said she won't be upset if we go to Chitwa. Are well, we going to make a quick turn past um, Treehouse Dam, Twin Dams, and then um, if there's time allowing We'll pop over to Chitra. It's just going to drive slowly along these little habitats. I hope of finding some more woodland species that haven't yet revealed themselves. The hoopoe, 
the Natal spur fowl, for example. Some very common birds have missed, have uh, slipped under the radar. Senegal lapwing in the open. Another raptor, like a tawny eagle perhaps, or another vulture. I really like to find a large or greater spotted cuckoo. Anyway, Noelle's also still trying to find some more birds. Hopefully, she manages to find a lot. Thanks, Steve. I do hope that you managed to get a few more birds for your list as well. We could hear a yellow-breasted Apollos calling dry-ish riverbed area that's had some water from all the rains that we had. Because it's had some water from all of the rains that we've had, there's nice vegetation. We're also getting the very tall, tall, tall trees. So I'm on the lookout for the Apollos. I'm on the lookout for for um, fire finches, wax bills, and what, oh, the parrots as well. That's where I'm on the lookout. Now, we already have it on our list, but there's a beautiful male white-winged widow bird that's floating around in this gory bush up and down and around, and some females that are flying here and there. Oh, he's perched so nicely, nice and close to us. And then he's back to the back again, fanning that tail as he flies in between the two bushes. Beautiful bird. And then... Yeah, it's absolutely stunning. Now, there's some little birds, just where he landed in that gory bush, there's some little birds that are flitting about near him. Some are the females, busy exercising their wings and showing off. And then I thought, I thought just maybe there was a fire finch in there, but I'm not seeing it at the moment. Bird behavior is amazing when you are able to just sit and watch it. They are endless, endless fun. They provide endless annotations into wildlife behavior. And also if you're sitting, say, with a sleeping lion, for instance, you're waiting for it to get a little bit cooler and the lion to get active, to sit there and bird is the, is the best part. I've had many a game drive with many a serious birder that has allowed us to actually find quite a few predators just because we're sitting in one spot and birding and things get interested, like our hyena that came past us yesterday. Now, I believe Steve has a bird that he's busy trying to show you on camera, so let's head back to him. Yes, maybe we get it. Two of them, common simitable. See if you can get him in there. There's two. Here we go. I'm going to play the call for you. Very eerie sound, isn't it? Common submissible. Very long recurved beak. Black beak versus the green wood hoopoo's red beak. Much, much more curved. You see that? Very nice. Another one of those birds that are quite common, but uh, not always seen. You can see the beak is dark black. And uh, the male and female also got a slightly different sort of degree. Oh, there we go. Off they go. Different degree of their, uh, of their beak, so as to obviously eliminate the competition that they find between themselves. So you find them in pairs sometimes, but uh, normally they're found on their own. Whereas when you find the green woodupus, they're always found in, in groups. They are co co cooperative breeders, whereas the Simitable is not. It's a pair bond. And I can say only probably a handful of times in my life I've actually seen two of them together. So possibly that's a male and female, or maybe it might be a, a newly fledged juvenile that's following one of the adults around, trying to learn the tricks of the trade. Just here at 10 o'clock BK on that branch, what have we got? 
Oh, looks like a boontang. Could have been a boontang. James Henry likes to call the buntings boontangs. <laughs> Okay, well, Noelle's got her binos out. I wonder what she's looking at. I do have my binos out. We have a green backed Cameroptera that's not far from us. Just, I think, in this tall, tall Tambuti tree. And I'm just trying to find him. Morris is also having a look. He's very close by. They usually sit at the tops of the trees. And we're just going to creep a little bit forward. You can hear him going tick, 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 tick. Come with me, guys. Come with me. Tick, 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 tick. Tick, 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 tick. All right, where are you? Green-backed Cameroptera, one of the smaller birds, liking the tall canopies. Let's have a look again. Grayish green mixes in with the foliage, so you're actually looking for him to be moving in and around the tops of the trees. Now I can hear his mate calling from over here, calling back and forth to each other. But with this very gray backdrop, we're only getting the call. So we're going to try and see if possibly we can get a view on this one over here. Now, they can see us coming from a long way off. They're not overly concerned about us, but it doesn't mean that they necessarily want us to get too close. So part of the thing I love about birdings is that it teaches you patience. And patience can sometimes be a hard thing to come by in a world where you constantly feel like you have to be moving. So I've got friends that fish to sort of calm down and and collect their thoughts. And then I've got a lot of friends who bird to calm down and collect their thoughts. Now, one of the reasons why little birds like this that blend in so nicely with the environment have a consistent call is this is how their partners find them. Now you can see all this vegetation that we have here. And we're talking about a tiny, tiny, tiny little bird. So if he blends in and is tiny and sits in the canopies, the only way that other Cameroptras are going to know that it's his territory and also that the if females want to find him is for him to call and call and call and call and call and call. And he's sadly eluding us at the moment, but that's okay. We're also still listening for our parrots. We might also even find a nightjar in here. I've actually been in this area before and found a nightjar roosting in a tree. That would be a really good find. Nightjars in the daytime, roosting in the tree. Oh, sassy catsy, good question. You want to know if we have any pigeons? Um, speckled pigeons. And then there was a pigeon that I saw the other day. I was, I think it was in a different part of Southern Africa. Eastern olive, Eastern olive pigeons, but they should be, they should be in this area. Not something we see often. Um, feral pigeons you'll obviously get in the cities from time to time. What's up in there? I feel like Dora the Explorer. <laughs> Let's go to Steve. I think he's got an actual bird to show you. <laughs> Finally. That's all spur foul. Orange legs, orange beak. Thank you, Natal Spurfile, for finally choosing to be seen and heard.
that big is charging. So very commonly seen when they pop out on the road like this. But until they do that, well, <laughs> we were trying the other day and it kept popping back into the long grass, making it impossible to see. I got a bird shouting up in the tree. I think it's just a grey-headed sparrow, but um, I just can't see him. Sounds like a sparrow. They make a lot of noise. And there's a Cameroptera calling in the drainage there. Not easy to get on camera. When they're around, um, we've been seeing them. We've been seeing the go-away birds. Um, I don't think they're any less as a woodland kingfisher up there. We'll claim him though, we've got him. Let's get him out anyway, Beaks, because there's a whole lot of other birds calling around us right now that I wouldn't mind seeing. Oh, I can hear a fan-tailed flycatcher. I can hear a bearded woodpecker. Beaks up ahead of us here at 12 o'clock, just in that bush, just above the road. There's two birds there. I can't quite make them out in this light. Hopefully you can. Directly above us there. <laughs> Are you going to land around the floor here? That's beautiful. Land right on the ground. That'll help us identify you. Off they go. Oh, there's a current shade thrush over here and a directly here there's a brown crown chugger beaks at one o'clock. Whoa, he's just gone into the bush there. Where are you? Over here somewhere. In in the back bush. Oh. Chain thrush that jumped in here, as well as a brown crown chagra. Let's see if we can maybe call them out. Come on, type. Have you got something? Yes, there's the brown crown chagra. Very good. That's very nice to see. Okay, and then we've got a Currachain thrush, which I'm going to play. This is the uh, territorial call. That's the call I heard, the one you're hearing now. Maybe he will present himself. Now the two Chagras, one's got a brown crown, one's got a black crown. Quite easy to identify the two of them. The black is quite noticeable on the top of the head. There's a scrub robin BK, 11 o'clock. White, broad scrub robin. You see him? Oh, he's gone. <laughs> They are nearly impossible to get on camera. 
Okay, well, you carry chain thrash. He's just flown down there. They're very skulky birds. Maybe we'll get him in the drainage there. There's lots of fan tailed flycatcher calling. Okay, we'll we try to get this curry chain thrush view in the meantime, see if Noel is having any more luck her side. I feel like I'm in the jungle, everybody, weeding through all of these bushes, moving about very slowly, stalking the birds. We had a green winged patilla and our greenback camaroptera that popped up, but they were flitting about. Morris is being extremely helpful, helping us try to find them. But we, Morris and I are also complaining a little bit. The small little birds are very hard to get on camera for you. So we're very slowly moving through. Morris, I'm thinking maybe we sit on that termite mound and watch for a bit. Jasper, you'd like to know if lapwings, like the blacksmith lapwing we saw earlier, sorry, I'm covered in spider webs, would dive any predators, or even people like myself and Morris and Owen, if, we, if their nest was around. For certain, they definitely would. They do a broken wing display to lure predators away, and then they also dive bomb. It's called mobbing behavior to get through to to deterring whatever's around. Now, they usually do mobbing behavior. Sorry, Owen's just gonna have to pull a little yoga move here. There we go. There's a stump, careful. Um, if there's something larger like ourselves or an elephant or a vehicle, and they think that we're going to hurt their eggs or their nest in any way, they will move above our heads and dive bomb like that. Sorry, I've just heard Brew Brew. Also heard a scrub robin, which we don't have. I think this is a good spot. We've got this nice little Tambueti thicket behind us. We've got the river, the little drainage line in front of us. Lots of habitats here. I think we're going to sit here for a bit and let the birds come to us rather than us going to the birds, as it were. Got some knob thorn trees around. It's also a very good spot. If Tangana comes back on the property, he really likes this area. Just as an FYI. What are you? You are a black headed oriole, which we have already. It's okay. It's also a good area for parrots. And we need some green wood hoopoos. Well, those we haven't ticked off. We've got lots of dead wood around for them to tap, tap, tap and look through things. And also golden-tailed woodpecker we don't have yet. So don't have Bennett's woodpecker. This is a good spot, my friend. Morris, now you must just call all the birds. Can you call them all? No, Morris is just laughing at me. I worked with a guy many years ago. He could mimic every single animal and every single bird. But to a T, he was amazing. Sorry, Megs, my radio had a little bit of a moment there. <laughs> Janet, that's a really good question. Janet wants to know what an average territory for birds is. So, Janet, every species has an average territory, and every species is going to be different for each one, um, especially because of the habitat that they're in. So, for instance, something like the little tiny birds that we're looking for, this tiny little space... A few meters by a few meters might just be enough for them. Vultures are known to have more of home ranges rather than territories, and they travel far, far, far distances all the way across the continent. So each species is completely different, and the habitat of each species is basically their their territories, their areas are dependent on is their food there, is their water there, and do they have access to a breeding partner? And then that will define their territory. What do you see? Mm. There's a cuckoo at the far back one. There's a beautiful cuckoo at the far back one, but it's going to take a little bit of maneuvering. 
Yeah. Yeah, so, oh, and I'm going to see if I can find it for you. There looks to be a Piet my fro, Piet my fro is a red breasted cuckoo. But, Owen, from your angle, you're not going to get it there. Let's come down here a little bit. Um, or you're going to have to go actually go up the termite mound. We only have five minutes left in the bird challenge. So, Owen, I think maybe if we come this side, come around here. All right, there we go. So we've got this dead tree that's here in front of us here, this, the thin one that has a V. Through the V, you'll see a back dead tree and at the top is a cuckoo. So you're gonna, no, you're gonna have to zoom out. So that dead tree, look in the fork of there. Nope, up to, up, up. Zoom out a little bit, please. Go up. Okay, through that dead fork in the back. Got him. Use the extender quickly. Now, viewers, I just need you to confirm my call there. It's a bit far. I'm going with Pete my fro, red chested cuckoo, from where I can see and what I can see. But you guys make that call. Good spotting, Morris. Let's go quickly to Steve, who has another bird. Thanks. Oh, we had a bird. We had a cuckoo. We had a Deirdre's cuckoo. Let's see if we can see him. There we go. Big go left. Left. Here we go. Middle of the screen. There we go, there's a dead just cuckoo. Very nice. Heard him calling, and he's above his uh, or her characteristic, this nest, this weaver colony nest that we have here. Dead just cuckoos are being very busy. They're going to breed again, considering the vegetation so good, and then the weavers are breeding again. So it's a time of plenty for all of our birds. And uh, let's uh, do one more bird beaks. In front of us in this bush, five million quelias landing in the bush. Red bull quelias, you see the whole tree is moving. Off to the right, they might be better. There they are, red bull quelias. Accumulating in large flocks. They're not in the breeding, they're not breeding at the moment it seems. You can see not many of them have too much. Oops, and off they go. That's the characteristic flocks and swarms that you see. Red billed quelia, the largest flocking birds known to man. Okay, well, Noelle's going to probably end the birding challenge with another bird of her own. We do. We've got a red back shrike male. It's just sitting there on the perch, and I don't think we have red back shrikes on our list yet, so that's absolutely fantastic. They come all the way from Czechoslovakia down to us for the breeding season. The females are very drab colored with little scalloping on the breast. The males have that beautiful gray head and then a red back, a little bit smaller than the gray back shrike, which we also get at this time of year as well. Very well spotted. Morris, excellent spot. Let's see if we can get one more bird. Steve, do you have any more birds that you can pull up on camera? We only have one minute left, everybody. The anticipation is killing me. Watch, right, right as we pull away, one of us, myself or Steve, is gonna manage to get like the bird. Up and there he flies and then off again. There you can see that red back nicely. He's doing a little bit of hawking or perch hunting. You can hear lots of birds, but most of them we have ticked off. We only have 30 seconds left before the end of our challenge. Steve, anything? I'm sure you're looking ferociously. No, it's this humidity and this cloud cover. And we keep getting doves that we already have. There's always doves around. I can't hear any cuckoos. 
no Cameroptras. Funny enough, the Scrub Robins. Oh, done. Thanks, everybody. Well done, Morris. Well done, Owen. Well done, Steve. Well done, BK. Thanks for helping us. That was af absolutely, absolutely awesome. So sorry, what was the numbers there, Megs? So Steve has 61 birds and we have 56, confirm. <gasps> Steve won! Well done, Steve. Five more birds than us. Well done, my friend, you busted it out. So Steve, your prize, Morris made you the other day, is your anklet. Steve got 61 and we got 56. Not bad, and we got over the 100 birds because originally it was a 100 bird challenge that we just zhuzhed up a little bit. So we'll present this to Steve a little bit later. And we're heading back to Steve, who actually has another bird for us. Hmm. Well, we were on our way to uh, the Batelier to round it off when we heard the cuckoo. Believe it or not, I hadn't yet seen a Batelier. But we know where these guys hang out. They're normally quite easy to find. Well then, well, nice challenge. Nice to be out and about with some birds. Nice to... Uh, to challenge ourselves as well. I hope you've all learnt a few things about birds. I've tried to convey some information about them as well, not just IDing them. Final Control has been very happy, learning a whole lot of birds, practicing linking, quick, quick links. <laughs> and if you've enjoyed it, if you do know I like to do birding, birding drives where you focus an entire drive on birds. It's been interesting, and you've noticed how. With the wind, with the weather being as overcast as it is, that I mean, to only get 62 or so birds in this period of time is pretty, pretty poor in my opinion. This time of year, you know, I think I did a drive with Dave, an afternoon drive. We got 57 birds a few months ago in December or January. Um, when the light is suitable, you can find birds a lot easier. They're more active and easy to spot. Easy to sort of differentiate the difference between certain species. But birding is fun. So the one tool I'll be taking with me to America with my snowboard is my binoculars. Yes, just saying. Very nice challenge. I hope you all enjoyed it. We all won, as you say. Nice to, uh, nice to, to uh, put ourselves all to the test as well. Kudos to the cam ops and D Dex rang, and they did a sterling job trying to get all these birds on camera. It's not easy with us going left, BK, right, BK, up, down, nine o'clock. Kudos to, kudos to them indeed. Okay, well everybody, we're going to go to Chitwa anyway, because, uh, well, I've been wanting to go to Chitwa. But at least we, we didn't win with Chitwa. We won with just good old fashioned birding. Some nice woodland species. Good morning. But uh, what is amazing is some of the common birds we haven't seen. Haven't seen a single stork, single heron. So aquatic birds can often make up an enormous number of a tally. Uh, whenever I've done birding, proper big birding days or birding challenges, you've got to go to aquatic area. Sandpipers, green shanks, um, different plover species, uh, many different duck and geese species, moorhens, different dab chick species. It's, uh, there are some places if you could go where there's wetlands, jacanas and crakes, cord crakes. Many, many birds that we haven't been able to find, but well, we'll continue on and see what else we can find. But in the meantime, Noelle is perched on top of a turmoil mount. I wonder what her plans are for me. We are, we're busy making our way off the turmoil mount and we are actually gonna go look to see if we can find any cats. Steve got that beautiful leopard sighting for you guys yesterday. I haven't seen a leopard in a while. I'd like to see a leopard or a lion. Either one will be fine. So we're gonna see if we can pick up some tracks and some signs. And then I think we might do a little track and sign quiz. And that being said, I've actually found your first question. 
So we've got a little bit of dung here. And I'm going to bring out my trusty ruler that you all seem to like so much. So you can see the size of it. Now there's quite a bit of it around. Usually you only find sort of three or four, sometimes five, in a little concentration. About the size of my pinky nail. And if I break one open, these are actually nice and fresh. You can see how fine that is. It's quite well digested. And they're actually all over the ground here. So I'm gonna say that this is where this particular species likes to sleep, most likely during the day. Because at night they're busy moving around and consuming food. And a lot of the moisture they get in their bodies is from consuming food in the evening and in the night when there's more moisture. This is a scrub hair. So a little scrub hair dung. So you guys can keep that in your brain because I might ask it later. We're gonna do a couple of ones to get you into the mindset. And then I'm going to set it up and it's gonna be up to all of you to guess what it is. And when I set up those ones, I won't be using my trusty ruler. You'll just have to guess. All right, we're in a lovely little spot right on the edge of the drainage line. Grass is not too tall, which is lovely. Gives us a little bit of a vantage point as well. <laughs> Painted Wolf, you said now for the 100 dung challenge. I like it. I don't know if we would, <laughs> if we would manage it, but I do like the idea. <laughs> Meg says, please, no. This is gonna be a little bit of a squeeze there. Hold that down. I can hear the birds talking. Now what's interesting about this is even when it's wet, like right now there's lots of dew, even when it's wet it still has oils in it that mean that it can light on fire nicely. So if you're lost in the bush and you need some tinder, you can't find any dry wood, turpentine grass does the treat. And if you were here to smell it with me, it smells just like turpentine. The grass at the base actually smells a little bit more than the inflorescence on the top at the moment, but that's a good one. So if you possibly also want to keep insects away from you, you can rub it on your body like this. Now we found a nice game path, nice animal pathway, and this is mostly what we follow when we're walking through the bush because the animals have already created it. Don't fix something that's not broken. Makes this quiet. I've got a Swenson spur fowl playing king of the hill. Surveying his territory, flying up a little bit higher than the other spur fowl in Franklin's, making his call, defining his territory. Steve has more birds, seems we can't get away from them, so let's head on over to him. Mm, well, there's just these birds perched on top of the tree, looking so beautiful. Yellow throated petronia on the left, it seems like. Oh, he's gone. And the other two are grooming. I don't know what they are. They're probably sparrows. Looking very fluffed up. Yeah, that's a sparrow. Oh, I thought it was something else. All fluffed up, he looks so much bigger. We are on Chitwe, everybody. We're about to head down to the water to go and have ourselves a coffee. And we find ourselves on standby for a lion sighting. Very good. Now we're just going to sit here quietly at the dam, have a nice little coffee, and then uh, when the time is right, there's one single lioness not far from Chitwa Airstrip. So hopefully, I'll get the comms. Last time, I apparently wasn't getting comms. Here we go, there's a vehicle. To chat to them. Okay, well, Noel has found some bird eggs. No doubt Morris has found another nest. Indeed, indeed, Morris, our eagle eyed Morris, has found another nest. This is a dove's nest with dove eggs. From the size of the nest, I'm going to say something like a Cape turtle dove, and the size of the eggs as well. Steve, I'm jealous of your possible lioness. I do hope you get visual for everybody. That would be a great addition to our sunrise safari this morning. Now I'm just going to, without disturbing anything, I'm just going to slip my 
ruler in just a bit just so you guys can see the size of those eggs without touching anything. Now we've been chatting over the past few days about what a dove nest looks like and you can see all those thick messy sticks that are a platform kind of cupping but more of a platform. We're also being very careful not to disturb the branches too much. What a find. Thank you Morris. He's, just so everybody's aware, he spotted that from probably about 60 to 80 meters away with his eagle eyes. So we're going to carry on on our search for tracks and for signs and for cats. Now, interestingly enough, that could actually be a question for an assessment because of the type of nest it is with the, with the eggs. So you would say dove. Um, you wouldn't necessarily have to say Cape Turtle Dove, but I'm, I'm postulating because of the size of the nest and the size of the eggs that it is a Cape Turtle Dove. Now, another question you might have would be this. So I'm going to show it to you, and you guys decide. You're going to tell me what it is. We've had a couple of practice ones. So you can see the color of it. You can see the contents of it. And remember on a track and sign assessment, you're not allowed to touch anything. Just this question would be, what species or what is it? And then you have to look and you have to know. So I'm going to leave that one up to all of you. You can take a little shot there. You guys can think, think, think away. And as you are thinking away, I'm going to show you one of my favorite little flowers, the blue comaledon, which has a zygomorphic structure. If I'm remembering correctly, I think that's the correct term. But my brain is on a funny little mission yesterday evening and today where it doesn't quite want to work all the way. So basically, it's symmetrical when you fold it in half vertically, but if you fold it in half horizontally, it is not symmetrical. The story that I know about this flower is that there were three brothers that were botanists, botanists and ecologists, and one of the brothers passed away when he was younger. So when the brothers discovered this flower, um, it was named partly for their brother. And this petal here and this petal here are supposed to represent the two brothers that survived, and this little petal on the bottom is supposed to represent the brother that passed away early. Now, I believe that you all have some answers for our track and sign. Darcy Ann, you're guessing buffalo. All right, what else do we have going on? Tiger's Cub, you say Ellie, Ellie Poo. Any other ones? Alan, you say buffalo. All right. So with a buffalo, a buffalo is a ruminant, and a ruminant has four chambers to its stomach. So it chews and re-chews its, its food constantly. Now, with that being said, when you get a pellet or the patty-type shape you would get with a buffalo because of the type of vegetation it eats, those pellets sort of meld together, you're getting an inside that is very... Uh, fine, it was similar to what we saw with the scrub hair. You're also getting contents that are going to be more dark green on the outside and uh, sort of darkish black on the outside and a sort of dark green on the inside because buffaloes are grazers. Now what we're seeing here inside of this dung is you're seeing lots of coarse, coarse, coarse material. So it's material this animal cannot digest fully, right? You're seeing a reddish tinge, which means lots of tannins, which usually denotes a, an animal that is possibly a browser or a mixed feeder. And then this is very, very large, large dung you can see with my hand here. So this is not buffalo dung, but it is, in fact, elephant dung. Well done, everybody. Well done. I'll see if I can find you some buffalo dung for comparison. I'm just going to take away this grass seed caught on a little bits of spider web all over us. All right, now as we keep walking and looking for tracks and signs, you don't have to actively look. There's lots of tracks and signs all around. You can actually see where quite a bit of wildlife has been walking and creating pathways and thus making us 
have easier access to different parts of the bush. Now, it looks like my friend Steve has made it to Chitwa Chitwa for a cup of coffee. Steve, I'm jealous of your coffee. Let's go and join him. Mmm, coffee, coffee, coffee. Really nice coffee. Well, it sounds like there's more than one lioness there, but they've gone into a very thick area. We're going to head on shortly and see if we can find them, but um, it doesn't sound like it's going to be the best view, but that's all right. There's also no updates as to who the lioness or the pride is. And we find ourselves at Chitwe. We had two green-backed herons fly over the dam right past us a little while ago. Probably go into the little wetland below the dam wall that we used to drive into quite often. And remember what we used to see, we used to see wonderful um, saddled storks down there, green-backed herons, African jacana, even got white-backed, white-crowned night herons down there. Oh, someone's just found a honey badger. Very peaceful down here at the water. Very industrious weavers obviously doing their thing all over the place. Heard some hummocorps in the distance. Hmm, Sarah, so many migrate. The swallows, the, all the cuckoos, um, many of the aquatic birds, sandpipers, green shanks, um, European roller that we haven't seen, woodland kingfisher, Warburg's eagle, steppe buzzards, also known as common buzzards, steppe eagles if they if we found any. <coughs> There's many birds that do leave, about a third I would say. Maybe more than a third, 33 percent. Someone might know the actual number, but it's it's a it's a fair number of them. European bee eaters, but leaving is difficult. Migration is hard to fly all the way to another continent, all the way north, all the way to somewhere else. It makes life very very difficult. So staying behind leads to specialization but then also competition with various resources, hence the specialization. Some of the birds, like the weavers and the quillias, don't migrate out. They have sort of local movements. They lose their breeding and they just become nomadic moving with regards to the food resources available. Okay, well, Noelle has found another bird's nest. Which one has she got? We did indeed. Morris's eagle's eyes found us another dove's nest, but inside this dove's nest are not eggs, but two little fledglings. So we've been talking about precocial and altricial birds for during our bird challenge. These are altricial birds. You can see that they have tiny, tiny little feathers. They're not really moving. They need mums and dads love, support, guidance, feeding for a little while longer before their full plumage starts coming in and they're able to fly off. They also need time to get their bodies working. Now we've got a few, and by a few I mean two, so a couple of laughing doves that are watching us from one of the trees nearby. And I am going to make the assumption that this is laughing dove fledglings just from the proximity of the parents, but that doesn't mean that this is 100%. It's just going to be my guess. Absolutely fantastic. Little eyes closed, not really moving. Just waiting for mom and dad to come back and feed them. Now, if they were a little bit older and a little bit more energized, you would be hearing them crying and crying and crying and crying and crying to be fed. Excellent. Thank you so much, Morris. Owen, as always, great camera. 
Now we have a buffalo patty that I'd like to show you that's just at my feet here. Just to give you a comparison from that elephant dung. So it's a little bit older, but just same, same as the elephant dung. The elephant dung was also old. But you can see that it's in a round little patty shape. You can see that it's quite squishy looking, for lack of a better term. And these little ridges that are in here, those are the pellets that, because of the nutrition of the grass, have sort of squished together to form this patty. This is what buffalo dung looks like. And now if I open it up just a little bit, you guys can see that green that we were discussing. And you can see how much more digested it is compared to the elephant. Remember, an elephant only digests about 25% of what it eats. Buffalo digests quite a bit more. Buffalo is a grazer. Elephants are bulk mixed feeders. Excellent. All right, let's go in search of some more track and sign questions to ask you. Maybe we find some more birds. Maybe we find some more birds' nests. I actually wouldn't mind finding a flycatcher's nest for you. They make these beautiful little cup-shaped nests with spider webs and things. Now Steve's still at Chitwa Dam, and I think he's still waiting to see if he can get a view of that lioness, so let's head on over to him. Probably thanks. I'm just standing by on Chitwa Dam also, if you can let me know. Thank you. Okay, so we are on standby one now. It's interesting how all that happened without any radio communication. So we are still here. Now, BK, come on, back to the log. Back to the log, see if we can see it. <laughs> there was a green bacteria in there. Come on, BK, do your job. <laughs> no. Okay, let's go. We're going to go and have a look at these lines. We've been offered our spot. Kobe, thank you. Uh, just southern side of the airstrip. Okay, so everyone's leaving because uh, the visual is very bad. But that's because we have more we have more patience than most people do. So we'll go and hang out. Oh, there's a ground hornbill. I will claim a ground hornbill on the right here, BK, at one o'clock. To a birding. I mean, hoping while sitting at the dam wall here to hear a trumpet or hornbill coming from inside Chitra camp. But alas. Okay, well there's a ground hornbill, an endangered species. And sitting beautifully on top of the tree. Let's go to our potential line sighting. That's apparently not very good. Alright, a wire's been broken here. No idea. I'm not sure if we add it to the list, Mix. I'm going to sneak up here. Should be able to get the sighting. Hopefully, I'm not going through the back of Chitra's back office here. Beaks. Oh, there's another Natal spur foul. Just when we got you already. Okay, well, while we try to relocate on these lines, it's injured and well, who's still out enjoying the bush. I'm enjoying the bush and I have your next truck and sign question. What happened here? So look at the bigger picture. And then we can go in and look at the finer details. What happened here is the question. You guys can send through your answers. Remember, don't forget to look at the bigger picture as well as the finer, <laughs> finer details. I need a cup of coffee, Steve. Please send over a cup of coffee by airdrop from Chitwa Chitwa. I'm excited for that possible lion sighting. Be good to see some lions for a change since they keep eluding us. I'm curious to know what lioness is there. 
So what happened here is the question. I've got a little bit more evidence for you just behind you here, Owen. You can see some more evidence of what was happening here. The bigger pictures over there where Owen was showing you, but here you can see where this animal has been feeding. Indigo girl, you're saying something laid down. All right, so indigo girl, if you had to pick a species that laid down here, what species would you pick? So remember, we want to say what happened here. Siberia, you're saying crocodile, interesting. I'd like to know how you got to that side. Diana, you're saying leopard. So guys, remember, we're not asking for species, we're asking what happened here. What happened here? Gail says a buffalo herd laid down. I think we've got time for one or two more guesses. Sorry guys, as I'm sitting here questioning. What does Michael say, Megs? Michael, you say what happened here is that no animals were killed. All right. <laughs> okay, so Gail, you're the closest. This is where a buffalo lay down to sleep. Very, very, very good. It's possible that there was a larger herd here. I'm only seeing evidence from one at the moment, but very good. So what happened here is a buffalo laid down to sleep, well, to ruminate, we should say. It laid down to rest and to ruminate. The feeding behavior I showed you just there was from the buffalo eating a little bit. That is a big buffalo dung, and this is where the buffalo was resting, most likely during the evening or during the middle of the day. Very well done, Gail. All right, so we're going to carry on looking for more track and sign questions for you. Now, I can hear some frogs, which makes me think that there is a water pan, possibly a little muddy water hole, close by. We might get some good tracks there, also some possible good signs. Just having a look as we carry through. So Gail, here's evidence that this was in fact a herd. We've got some more buffalo dung, very spread out. Good, good, good. Also signs of some old doggo boys in here. Just waiting for you all to catch up this side. So let's maybe head on over to Steve who I think is actually catching up with a lion. There's at least two lionesses here. I believe it to be of the tortured pride. And I've just got into this little bush. It's just the southern side of Chitwa Airstrip. And this is the kind of view that the other guards didn't like. They're all driving away. But we've got patience. We've got persistence. And well, we will stay here. It's not the best view. I'm just going to go back two meters. I'm about to see her face there. Got her beaks? in there. <laughs> Sorry about the visual everybody, but um, imagine being a poor little impala with these lions hanging around. Oh, they're going to play. They're going to play. She likes you, PK. She likes you very much. <laughs> She's going behind the car. Let me just reposition so we can get a view if the other one comes out. Oh, 
Now that's patience. Now that's patience. See, what happens if you just decide to go anyway? Yes, it does, Ruth. You should have heard the radio. Everyone's like, oh, the lions are going into the thickets. We can't see them. <laughs> other places to go, other things to see, I suppose. We were standby three. We're now the second in the sighting with no one else interested in coming. That's all right. So I've had sight of two. This lioness and another one in the thickets there. And the vehicle with us. Snazzy, you like the face expressions, yeah. Oh, they're very pretty. Lines are very, very cool. <laughs> Bundu bashing, if they could come to join us. And they do look young. I don't know the makeup of the pride at the moment. Apparently 14 or 15 of them, but they're not always together. You can normally tell age by the nose. And her, uh, her nose is quite dark, which actually means she's probably not as young as you think. But their fur and faces look quite good. A sign that there's not that much competition when they're fighting and if the tortured pride is broken up into smaller groups and there's just a few lionesses hanging out together there's not going to be the same sort of confrontation and conflict that you find when there's males hanging around or a whole lot of males within the cub range the sub adult range that leads to a lot more conflict a lot more scratches on the face a few lionesses together. We saw what four the other day. Now we've seen two. Now you know lions go through that feeding and not feeding and feeding and not feeding and yeah of course they their bellies look like they could do with some meat, but their condition looks good. Always look at the hips of a lion and a leopard. The hips are looking good. But um, it's not easy to hunt this time of year. Prey animals hide, and they're also accumulating in large groups. Unless they manage to catch a buffalo, and there's only two of them. It's very unlikely they're going to catch a buffalo if there's only two. She likes you, Biko. Okay? Mm, she's very pretty. I think she wants to give you a hug. Do you want a hug from a lion? <laughs> to be the the tightest and last hug you ever have. <laughs> remember we were with them the other day with the four of them and uh, they were definitely hungry and the thing that stopped them moving more was the heat I don't think that's going to be the same problem today so maybe we'll get them active again shortly but in the meantime well we'd like to show you another track and sign Hello everyone. I do hope that BK decides not to hug that lioness. She'll smell quite bad and she's actually not that fuzzy and cuddly. What we have for you though is another track and sign question. The question is what species? What species? Now I don't want to keep you from the lions for too long so I think what we might do is you guys have a look 
take a little screenshot. We'll send you back maybe to Steve, hopefully who still has visual of the lions. And then, oh, it looks like Steve is still busy relocating or removing himself. So we can actually stay with us a bit longer, which is good. We won't take away from those lions. So what species is here? You guys can send through what you think, what species. Now, because it's a track and sign quiz, I'm not putting my ruler down. I want you guys to decide for yourselves. There's some really great information inside this track. What species? Boo-boo, you're saying warthog? All right. Anyone else? So when we're looking at the track, we're looking at several different things. We're looking at the shape. Tiger, cub, you say buffalo. We're looking at the shape of the track. Pop rocks, you say impala. So we've got calls for warthog, buffalo, and impala. Those are all very, very, very good calls. And Seneca says giraffe. All right, so we've got calls for warthog, buffalo, impala, and giraffe. Now I'm going to show you guys the defining features you should be looking for. This is a very rounded track. It is an ungulate, a hooved animal. You can see the split there. Now the split's a little bit wider than normal because it went into the mud, but this is a relatively round, very circular track that is about... Ooh. How many centimeters is that? Let's call it about 70 centimeters, but my stuff's worn off. I'll look on the other side. There we go, Noel. Yeah. But probably a little bit larger as well. Let's put it down for you. Okay. So there we go. It's a little bit longer than 70 because of the way that it's smushed in. Now, the other two things you want to look at are the dew claws that are present. Okay, so a very round, round, round track, like a circle, and dew claws that are present. And it's a short circle, it's not a long oval, and it's not a square. So warthogs are small tracks that are very square, that sometimes show the dew claws, which I know you guys are looking at a screen, and this, so the size can be difficult, but they're very, very, very square. And if they were inside this kind of mud, the definition would be taken away. So because this is a larger animal, you can see more of the definition. If it was a giraffe, you would see a lot more length and the dew claws would not be present, all right? And then if it was an impala, it would be like a little triangle shoved in there um, and very, very blunt, okay? This is a very round track with dew claws, so it is in fact a buffalo. Now it's interesting for me trying to explain to you guys tracks and signs on the on the screens that you're looking at because obviously size can be harder so we have to look at what else is around in the track so i think while we're busy looking for some more tracks and signs we can go back to steve who i hope has a better visual of those lions for you mm, just reposition slightly Put that patch of grass out the way Second lioness is still not revealed herself. But the other vehicle moving out. Seems like we're going to be left again all alone with our lions. Terrible. I hate being all alone with lions, don't you, BK? Dora, these lions, the Tortured Pride, if it is indeed the Tortured Pride, they take up a fair amount of tortured. They go into the Kruger National Park. They take this side of Cheetah Plains and Chitwa as well as down a little bit. Um, I'm not sure exactly how far because uh, we don't spend any time with them. So they probably spend uh, a lot of time in the Kruger National Park um, but we don't get to see them a lot. I hear a lot of updates of, of them when we are on Juma of people on tortured trying to track them down. They also go as far as into Buffelsuk a little bit, but the Talamati seem to be taking over much of that area. So that is very interesting. Obviously, we don't spend enough time with them to really get their movements, this being the third time I've ever seen them. But obviously, the Tortured Pride gets its name from Tortured.
but uh, as we've noticed our pride seem to be ranging further and further and you don't seem to be too to see too much solidity in pride and territory boundaries at this time of the year but as soon as the food resource becomes less sort of spread out and more localized around water points you'll see those territorial boundaries solidifying to some more of a strong degree fuzzy little chin. You almost want to just give a little tickle, don't you? <laughs> As I said with BK's hug, it would be his last hug and your last tickle. Okay, so the other lioness is really ensconced in the bushes there. I wonder if she might come out. I don't know how many more there were. I heard initially there was one female lioness. And we got here. I saw a second one. But it's probably most likely that all four of them are together here. And they're looking hungry, so... We could have some joy. What do you feel like? Do you feel it be okay? We're going to have some joy? Hmm? Sparrow, you reckon they've got very deep set eyes? Well, they've got a very characteristic predator sort of eye in the fact that the two eyes are in the front of the face looking forward, the binocular vision. Um, all predators have got that set of eyes. You can actually tell the difference between predator and prey by where the eyes sit on the head. Now, all of your prey animals have got eyes on the side so that they can look in more than one direction simultaneously almost like having two GoPros on the side of your head you can imagine the field of view that you can generate from that and it doesn't give you the best focus on a specific object in front of you but it gives you a very good field of view behind you and above you and in every direction that a predator is likely to come from those early yawns when you just can't quite get it out you can't quite get it out she's going to yawn again it's going to be oh she's made me yawn Ooh. excuse me how many of you yawned because of that what is it have we has anyone figured out why if someone yawns and that bk's just yawned have any of you realized or figured out why why we yawn when someone else yawns I don't know what it is. I've always attributed it to being some form of vacuum. If someone's in the same room as you, they yawn and so they suck more air out of the oxygen out the air and suddenly you feel starved of it. But watching it on a TV screen, if it makes you yawn, there's something very weird about that. I wonder if anybody knows. Please let me know if you know why we yawn in response to someone else yawning. There she goes. Still not that big. Decent yawn, but you can do better than that, my darling. Oh yes, you're gonna come tell us how how good you are. Ooh. Down a facing dog. She is a youngster. Got no obvious suckle marks or mammary glands protruding. So sub adult still goes to show that the nose isn't so accurate. She has not had cubs before, which makes her probably less than three and a half. She looks big enough though to be at least at that age. Oh no, is that what you're going to drink from? No, she decided against it. So she's going to go hide in the bushes with the rest of the family. Let's go see if we can get a bit closer beaks. If she gets into the really thick stuff, we might stay with her for a little while. But let's see how it goes and see what the view's like. Meantime, Noelle is definitely doing some more track and sign this morning. 
I wonder what track she's got for you this time. I've got a quick track and sign for you while Steve sees if he can get another visual of the lioness. How amazing. This is the track that we are going for in here. So the question is, what species? What species? Now, as you all are thinking about what species has left that track behind, I'm noticing quite a lot of ant activity all over the road, which to me is signifying that there is some rain on the way. Usually before it rains, ants get very, 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 very busy going and finding food, checking that all their tunnels and their, their nests and their hives are all good, and then after the rain, they start cleaning everything up. So the question we have framed up for you is what species? Now look at the shape of the track, the finer details of the track. We've positioned it so that you're looking at the track in the direction that the animal is moving. So as if you were standing the same way that the animal would be moving, so behind the animal, if that makes sense. Nana B, you say antelope. Thanks, Nana B, but we need a little bit more detail. Maybe what antelope? Farah, you're saying water buck. Lovey, you're saying wildebeest. Anita, you're saying impala. Look at the shape of the track. Andrew, you're saying diker. So we've got impala, wildebeest, diker, water buck. <laughs> Another Noel says kudu. Hello, other Noel. <laughs> Common bear hugs being uber cheeky and saying definitely not a leopard. All right, so we've got lots of different ones that we have mentioned at the moment. So I am going to go through what you guys have said. Now, one of the calls was for kudu. I've got my trusty little shapes out. So this is a kudu track, and this is a kudu track, male and female. Notice how long the kudu track is. Notice how you get a little bit of a split up here, a little bit of a split down here, and sometimes you're even seeing the thin line all the way down. The longest part of the track, or I should say the widest part of the track, excuse me, the widest part of the track is about here. So about a third up from the bottom, two thirds of the way down. This track that we're looking at here is very square, okay? Very, very square. So the widest part is roughly in the middle there. This track that we're looking at joins at the back, very square, joins at the back a little bit. You'll notice with the kudu that it doesn't join there. It's very definitive. It's also much, much larger than this track we're looking at here. This is the track here, and it fits inside that kudu track, male and female. So it can't be a kudu. This is a wildebeest, front and back track. So we can say just from size, cannot be a wildebeest. Also, this is a very square track. Wildebeest have more of an angular shape, quite a lot of soil that builds up at, in the middle part, the front and at the back. Very, very blunt. This is also blunt, but you can see that this is splaying a little bit in the front, very indicative of this species when the ground is wet. Then we had a call for diker and impala. So diker and impala. So a diker it's about this size, it can fit inside one part of this track, both the width and the length. And the impala is a very A shape, similar in the A shape to the back end of the wildebeest. You've got lots of soil that connects in there. And notice how wide it is at the back. This is connecting at the back. So guys, this track is in fact a warthog. Now, I kept giving it away by saying a square shape, all right? So you see how square the front, this is a front track of a warthog. You see how square that is? This is connecting at the back because of the soft soil that it was in. But you can see here that when it splays open, there will be a bit of connection there. Lots of soil in front and quite a large digging in of the blunt end there. That is a warthog track. Excellent. Oh, Lynn and Alice, you both guessed warthog. Well done, Lynn and Alice. 
All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that little bit of track and sign. Well done, everybody. I'm hoping Steve still has visual of that lioness. So I think let's go over that side and see what he's up to. Well, thanks, Noelle. Well, unfortunately, everybody, the lioness moved into the thickets. Let me just show you. Um, you don't often see this chitra map. So, this is the southern side of the airstrip. We were parked right there. Lines have gone into this thicket over here, and unfortunately, we can't even drive off road there. This is the cut line. This is like the southern amount of where we can go to. We can't even poke our nose into this drainage line. Unfortunately, they've gone just into here. Unfortunately, we can't go any further. That is a pity, but they moved out of sight from us anyway. So, sorry about that, everyone. Marlet says yawning comes from empathy. Is that true, Marlet? Is that your... So Marlet says those with low empathy will not yawn when others yawn. I must have enormous amounts of empathy. <laughs> Megan says she must have none. Oh, Megs, you've got so much empathy. Indigo Girl says involuntary trigger. I mean, I can understand triggers. For example, if I see somebody vomit it causes me i'm i'm a sympathetic i'm sympathetic in that regard and i it can cause me to so but if someone yawns i also so am i very involuntary <laughs> i'm a, i'm an invo involuntary when i see someone eat i get hungry Serious Wolf says it's ectoplaxia in psychology. Can you tell me the rest, Meg? Sorry. It's a lot of information to repeat. Echopraxia. An automatic imitation to others' actions. That sounds very official. I'll put my stamp on that. Hey, BK. Ectopraxia. Please tag me on that, Megs. I really want to remember that word. How to spell that. I'm saying it a bit strangely, but I would love to, love to write that down later. Thank you. You know, we learn on this show. Constantly learning. I like learning. Hmm, well... Oh, let me show you a little bit of a wart, wart pig over here. And an impala. A wart pig and an impala. Another impala. Oh, don't scare our warthog. He's a fantastic fellow, isn't he? We always talk about those tusks or the tushes. Look at that lower one, how it works against the top one as he talk as he eats. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. Hmm, I believe you've just been looking at tracks of Wartox. If you're uncertain of whether that was a boy or not. The easiest way to tell whether it's a boy is that ball genital sac on the back there. And if you don't get a chance to see that, then you'll see he's got two sets of warts on his face. And also just the sheer size. I remember the first time one of my guests saw one of these, they said, Oh look, there's a baby rhino! I was very excited until I looked and saw it was a warthog. 
Not that baby rhinos are not exciting to see, or water are not exciting to see, but... Um, <laughs> now, there's a go where birds shouting. And grey hornbills shouting. I don't know why. I'm just going to go back the way I was going to go. It's the way that they're sounding. I mean, I'd like to find a leopard that way. One day I'll find a leopard with uh, with grey go where bird calls. It's going to happen. It's a perfect sort of system down here. Back towards Chitwa Dam and the drainage line. Perfect sort of area for Chikachava to be hanging out in. Oh, there goes a juvenile African hawk eagle. That was why they were shouting. Hmm. They've gone now. That's why they've been shouting. So they weren't lying. I wasn't lying. Okay, well, we're going to just trundle on down here back towards the dam and back over towards Juma while Noelle makes her way through the long grass of Juma. We are. We've got your next track and sign question is, what happened here? What happened here? I want you guys to have a look at these branches. What happened here. So taking in this whole little area, the muddy bit, the water, those branches there, all over the grass here. What happened here? You can even investigate a bit of the markings that are this side, but don't get confused because there's also been other wildlife that have been here, but what happened here? Specifically focusing on this end of Ooh, it's a trip of this area here. What happened here? All right, you guys can have a think. I'm putting myself in the picture so you can see the scape of it. Viewers, you can think, 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 think away. You can also, maybe I'm gonna be a little bit nice to you guys. You can take into account what is left here, what's happening over there, what happened here. Nialosaurus, you're thinking elephants drinking and then moving about in the area. All right, Nialosaurus. That's a good one. Tiger cub, you're thinking of a rhino bathroom, a rhino midden. A few more comments, hopefully coming through. Nancy, you're saying a rhino mud bath. Linda, you're saying Ellie's eating the tree and the marulas. Kelsix, you're saying elephants digging for water. All right. So if we had a rhino mud bathing here, you wouldn't see all of this mud all over these trees, all right? Um, if the elephants were just drinking here, you wouldn't see the mud all over the trees, all right? So there is some elephant dung, there's some elephant damage over here. Basically what we're saying is the elephants came and they were mud bathing. So when an elephant mud baths, it picks up the mud and it scoops it over scoops it under and that's how you get this splash of mud all the way around in here. Now I pointed out some of the elephant dung that was there. I pointed out this, this is the signs of elephants, but this is elephants mud bathing. There's also some buffalo that looked like they came through and did a little bit of bits and bobs. Elephants mud bathing. Really great guys, you're getting into this. I'm enjoying that. Now I found myself in a little bit of a pickle. I'm gonna come around like this and try not to get too wet and I'm gonna have Owen try and backtrack himself that side and also not fall in and get too wet. So if you don't see me behind this tree for a little bit, please excuse me.
Premium, Premium, you're curious to know if we keep track of all of the animals in the reserve. So Premium, we do once a year, sometimes twice a year counts for species numbers um, on, on all of the reserves. And then, for instance, I was talking about that cheetah earlier in the show that had the babies in Medigwe. They keep track of her because of her research purposes for EWT. But in general, we keep a, a somewhat a general number of, of species we have so that we know that the habitat's being used correctly. And then as guides and trackers, we're keeping track of where the Talamatis are, where the Torchwoods are, where Leopards are, where other Lion Prides are, just so that we know where we're going to start looking for the day, who's who in the zoo, as it were, even though it's not a zoo, who's who. We need another, we need another phrase, Morris, who's who in the bush, who's who out in the wild. All right, this is a beautiful little flower. Now, I've seen this flower before, and I've seen it in these wet, disturbed areas, and I know we have quite a few flower fundies that watch the show. I'm wondering if any of you can help me identify this flower. don't have my flower book with me today. Steve and I were actually chatting, chatting yesterday about um, the fact that we can't actually carry all of our stuff with us, especially when we're on walk. We try and store as much information in our heads as possible. I have a photo of this flower I took yesterday. I actually have been meaning to look up. But now I'm going to use the flower fundies. So as we're waiting for answers, I think let's head back on over to Steve, who's having a little drive about, checking on things. We are driving about. Uh, no luck with the... Uh, well, obviously the birds are shouting at must have been the hawk eagle. We weren't able to find it for you again. It was a juvenile African hawk eagle with a brown chest. I really want to know what's going on with the weather because what's this day four of overcast conditions? I once experienced an October like this every day. It was like this in the northern Kruger and Pufuri Makuleki when October is supposed to be a very, very hot month. It's the last month of the trail season that I ran there. We closed sort of early November and everyone was warning me, October's going to be harsh. So I was like, okay. October came and every single day was like this. It was wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Cause we were walking five hours a day, four or five hours a day normally in the morning and then a little bit less in the afternoon. Okay, so those lions came from here. They came down Cheetah Cut Line. I wonder how many there were. So they came from Torchwood. Here we'll be able to see here. One, two. Looks like there's at least three. So it's getting difficult to count after four. So Uncle are apparently still at Mala Mala. <laughs> Very hard with this light to see, but lions are lying down here. Be able to identify one, two, three, and four. Okay, so four. That sounds about right, the four lionesses we saw the other day, which means that probably all four of those are them. But right here on the sort of cheetah cut line boundary, they didn't, I've never seen them on Juma. And yet the Nkwumas tend to take up most of that space, but the sticks used to spend a lot of time now where the torches are spending time. So these pride territories, they sort of just seem to move. We saw Shadulu demarcating a territory yesterday. If a pride comes along and finds a boundary not in place, they'll claim it or move it even further. You know, it's like a, a stick, a yard stick. They arrive and there's no one. Like, okay, I'll go a bit further. There's no one. Oh, there's still no one. They go a bit further. Oh, hang on, someone here. Okay, let's make this the line. And if then that is once again not demarcated, I'll just move it even further. 
Okay, very good. We're going to check our eastern boundary and then send you over to Noel, who's looking at some more tracks. We have your next track and sign question here. The question is what species? We're looking here. What species? And while you all are trying to figure out what species that might be, I have to say a big thank you to Judy H. Judy H, thanks. You are so good with your wildflowers, and I really appreciate whenever you send through your comments and questions and answers for us. So Judy H, this particular flower has no common name, just has a Latin name. I'm going to read the new Latin name, Afrosolin sandersonii, with a double I at the end, which means that it was named by a woman. Double I at the end means it was named by a woman. Now, Judy H., if you have any more information you'd like to share with us on that flower, that would be great. The most I know is wet, disturbed areas. Um, and I don't have any traditional medicinal knowledge on it. Uh, Morris didn't have much to say about it. He just says he knows it. All right, so we have our track and sign question. What species? Okay, I'm going to get, while you all are still thinking, I'm getting out my trusty track and sign cards which I like to use, and I know you all like that I use because it helps you. What species? Now we're on the sandier soils, the light's a little bit harder, but it's all part of the fun and games. And remember, we are busy putting these tracks into our brains, into these categories, so that we can store them for later use. Cal 6, you're guessing serval. Nana B, you're guessing hyena. Consulting detective, you're guessing white-tailed mongoose. Kayla, you're saying jackal. All very good ones. All very good ones indeed. All right. So, our track is here. Here is a hyena. So, our track size runs about... I'm going to put this down for you guys. You can see it. There's our track size. Here's the hyena. All right. Brown and spotted for the most part. More spotted, sorry, female and male, excuse me. The size itself takes it out. But also look at the half moon toe here and look at this toe here. Very, very, very round. All right. Then let's move on to jackal. Here is the blacked back jackal. Now the size is much more similar, but notice the space between the top toes and the claws. The claws here are very close to these toes. Also these toes are all very round, and this pad as well, quite round and bulbous. This is more of a triangle, and there's not a lot of space in between the toes there. Okay. Then we're going to get down to the white tailed mongoose. So a white tailed mongoose has a very square pad at back and a square with an, uh, a funny little hanging, I call it a hanging lobe, but an asymmetrical lobe. This particular species has a much more symmetrical lobe with two bulbous sides and then very round, round toes as opposed to oval toes. And again, look at the distance between the claws there. Then we also had one call for serval. Right, now we've chatted about the claws already and servals don't usually show claws. So the serval track is here. So you can see again, lots of space in between the pad, the back pad and the toes. There's not a lot of space here. These toes as well, a lot more oval. Okay, and also you would get three lobes at the back. This one has two very large lobes here and the presence of claws. So it cannot be a serval. This track is an African civet. Okay, see the notice the round, round toes here, 
not a lot of space, and the claws very close to the toes, right? And then notice the bulbous lobes, very symmetrical. You could fold them in on each other, bulbous lobes. These two outside toes that are very round, automatically with the size automatically bring you to civet, but these round, round toes on the outside. Good, guys, very good. Excellent. African civet you can now add to your memory banks. I'm having fun with the cards with everybody. This African civet was here probably last night, early this morning, running up the road, marking his territory. I still have to find you a civet tree, an African civet's lavatory. And I think while we're busy packing up and looking for more, let's head on over to Steve. Thanks, Noelle. Nice to get some tracking done on a day like this. It's not the best light to be seeing them. Anyway, we're still checking our eastern boundary. It hasn't been... Marcy, in my opinion, I saw lots of bee eaters this year. James commented he didn't see that many. But I saw many colonies and flocks of the European bee eaters, but no lilac, no European rollers. Um, one theory, well, there's two theories. I did post it to a lot of people on Facebook, of Facebook birding and uh, bird life South Africa. One of the theories that came back was that there's been locust swarms in um, the Horn of Africa. And why leave a locust swarm? Why well, fly 8,000, 7,000 kilometers if you don't have to? So that's a very, very valid point. Uh, another one is that um, their habitat is being de degraded where they come from in Europe. Pesticides, herbicides leading to their demise because they feed on insects and the insects that they are feeding on are being poisoned due to crops and all that. So that is a huge issue that's happening with rollers and insect eating birds from Europe. Another insect eating bird on the... Oh, of course he's going to fly away. Greenwood hoopoos. Um, and then another reason, possible reason, is global warming or climate change. Is that birds are staying in a place a little bit longer due to the fact that um, it's warmer and there's probably later blooms of insects. And then suddenly it gets to that critical time when they need to leave and they haven't left yet. So they're all like, oh, well, I haven't got my car serviced. I don't quite have enough energy, I didn't get enough food, I'm not quite through the malt, and those are characteristics that would prevent a bird from migrating. Um, so they're not getting the same environmental cues, or if they are, they're happening a bit late and then the bird leaves too late. So that's together with um, what I've already stated, and then also hunting of birds or trapping of birds is another thing that's happening. People across the world are catching birds for food. And I think mist netting, I think that might be another massive thing. It's happening with the Amur falcons. The Amur falcons population is being decimated by the fact that people are catching them for food. No, it's not good. I saw a few groups of them this year, but we used to see hundreds, hundreds in flocks. They come all the way from uh, northeastern Asia, all the way through... Asia all the way across India all the way through the sort of Israeli area and unfortunately it's a very long migration through a lot of human habitation and so population growth and demise of fish demise of other wildlife is causing people to focus on other avenues of food and when you're hungry, you don't really care too much about conservation or the survival of another species. It's a very classic Maslow's hierarchy of needs. When you have a very low income or very low economic standing, you have very little ability to think outside the box or to think of anything other than your own survival. Only once you start sort of establishing yourself financially and um, getting yourself out of debt or getting yourself above sort of certain standards can you start thinking about conservation and even education and things like that so 
Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you've never seen the pyramid before, it's a very important one and it does detail enormous amounts about human conditioning and human behavior. And that hierarchy can change. If you're on the top at one stage and suddenly you fall flat on your face financially, well, you're also not going to have the same altruistic view on the world if you're suddenly scratching in the dirt for food. Now, education, human condition around the world, and uh, obviously the gap between the rich and the poor is greater than it's ever been. We could talk about this for hours. So we can do what we can and try to do what we can. So although conservation areas are designed to conserve animals, birds have to migrate between them to get to their feeding grounds and uh, lots of perils along the way. And the biggest, biggest threat to international biodiversity and conservation is humans. We are the worst of it, the lot. Hello, Olifantes. Happy? Oh, hello, little one. There's a small breeding herd over here. I might try reposition to get you another view. They might come out and say hello to us as they like to do. Tell me you got her their beaks. Eh? get that one rather. Hello, little one. Are you going to come and show us how big and strong you are? You can already see it being, showing a few signs of being a little nonsense. <laughs> it knows it can be when mum's nearby. The typical behavior you get of young bulls. Like the buffalo, the elephant are loving the long grass at the moment. There's lots of elephant around. A lot of the reason for that has been the marulas. You don't get many marulas on the eastern side of the Kruger. Most of them are here on the west. Hmm. What fob have you got there? Oh, too, too late. Another one. I can't quite tell what it is. Oh, it looks like one of the bush peas. Now that's what you call stuffing your face, eh, BK? <laughs> stuffing your face. Does have a little leaf on the head. Okay, let's pull that whole fob out. Same again. Pull the whole thing out. Break it off, broke off the roots, shaking off the sand. Hmm. So you can see how selective the feeding is. There's so much vegetation around, and this elephant is specifically feeding on a particular plant. It's probably not even seeing it, it's just smelling it, going, ooh, it smells like a pear to me and eating it. There he is. Now the bee is eating a mass salad. Oh no, what can you do? What can you do? We should do that again because we had such good luck yesterday after eating that wonderful salad. I think I've We've got a bit more of an idea of how to cook it as well. 
African vegetables are tougher than uh, the normal varieties we find in our supermarkets, so they need to be treated as such. They need to be treated as more tough and cooked a little bit deeper. Probably lose a few of the nutrients by being more deeply cooked. I think it would have softened up the texture quite a lot. Very good. While our elephants are disappearing into the bushes, we're going to make a quick turn. Watch by Buffalsuk Dam, Buffalsuk Delta. Just, just go and count the goslings real quick. In the meantime, Noel is finding more tracks for you on the ground. We have, we've got time for two more track and sign questions. So question number one is over here. What species? Pointing to the middle of the track. What species? And then question number two is also over here. What species? Okay. There's some more examples. So we framed it up so you can see both. Question two, where I'm pointing here, what species? Question one, pointing to the middle of the track. What species? Right. What species? So question one and question two. So when you send through your answers, make sure that you say one and two so that Megs knows how to feed them through to me. I'm actually going to add a third question in. Owen, is this in screen? Okay. Is, okay, so this is question three. Also, what species? So this is the middle of the track. Question three, what species? What species, question two. And what species, question three. One, two, and three. I'm excited to hear what you all come up with. So Cal 6 is the answer to Cal 6 for question number one. Okay, so Cal 6, you're saying for question Rising Serenity, you're saying question one is hippo. So Anne, you're saying question two, giraffe, poop, dung. Tiermatch, you're saying question one is rhino. Any answers for question three? And Siberia, you're saying question three is a zebra. Excellent, guys. All right, so let's answer question number two first. This was the question, and there was more evidence. This one, this one, this one. There's some more evidence down here. All right, I'm going to put my trusty little ruler next to it. Let's go the other way. Okay, also my thumb, a bit too big for Impala, but now you guys obviously can't see how big it is because it's on screen, but you see how round it is? Impala dung is not round, it is more oval, right? Oval shaped, okay? So this falls into a category for roundness and for this little dinicky at the bottom here and also at the top, which you couldn't really right, quite see, but at the sides here, it's more likely going to be something like a kudu or a giraffe quite spread out all the way down and it actually goes with this track for question number three here. Put the thing next to here. This is in fact giraffe dung. Here's another piece of giraffe dung and this is the giraffe track. Okay, lots of soil contracting in the middle here. Nice and flat track. The animal was moving this way. So giraffe track for number three draft poo for number two. And then the question for number one, we can see one toe mark here, second toe mark here, third toe mark here, and then flattening into the back. This is the back track. The front track is here. One toe mark here, one toe mark here, another toe mark here. So this has three toes. The animal's moving this direction, the same direction as the draft. 
These tracks are relatively the same age, along with the dung. After some nice rain we had a while back, if it was a hippo, you would see two toes in front here rather than just one, and the side toes would be angled out. This is in fact a white rhino, a big white rhino bull, moving down the road. I'm going to just put my ruler next to it as best as I can, starting from the back. I can barely get up there. It is very, very big indeed, if that helps all of you size it. Excellent work with the track and sign questions, everybody, today. You're doing a really good job. I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. I'm now covered in dirt, but if you're not dirty after track and sign, then you're not doing it correctly. Now, I know that we've spent some good time with myself today and some good time with Steve, so I'm sure that Steve also wants to say goodbye before we go. So I think I'm going to leave you for now and say thank you very much, and I'll see you this afternoon out on Game Drive. Maybe we get more track and sign questions, or maybe Steve takes over and does track and sign questions himself. All right. We are just waiting for Steve to get through a little bit of a tricky signal dip. If he doesn't come out of it, you'll just stay with me, and Steve can say goodbye and hello on this afternoon's activity. So I'll be curious to know what else all of you are doing for World Wildlife Day. You can let us know this afternoon. And I'm hoping this afternoon that we get a few more cats. Yesterday's afternoon drive with Steve was chalker blocks. Our walk yesterday afternoon was also chalker blocks. So here's hoping that we have another great afternoon. Thank you all so much, and off to Steve. Thanks, Noel. Well, good tracking. Good effort this morning. Asked to, to have a bit of a, a birding challenge. We should do it again. But uh, maybe maybe we should stick it to one drive or a day. I don't know if it was a bit much for some of you viewers out there doing it over multiple days. <laughs> I'll do it all week. It was one of the things I really enjoyed when I knew when I knew that my students were getting more interested in birds. Well, before I got them more interested in birds, we started, there always been two vehicles going everyone sorry about that I think Steve went through a little dip so you get me for a few more minutes more that's okay Owen and I were just chatting about we were actually just saying thank you to everyone as we do towards the end of the drive and then we were just chatting about how hard it is especially when the cam ops is focusing in on one area and the birds jumping around so I was just saying thanks to Owen for sticking with me and also for me being all up in his personal space because sometimes I'm over his back end there and <laughs> excuse me, all up in the back and pointing at the screen and also looking with my binos, but it was fun. The birding challenge was good. And well done again, Steve, for winning. Steve won 61. We had 56. And amazingly, neither Steve or I went to Chitwood Chitwood Dam, so we didn't use that as a crutch. We worked a very small area and managed to get 107 birds. No, 117 birds. Please don't ask me to do math, guys. I'm really bad with math. So one thing I wish I had focused on a little bit more. So thank you again for a really wonderful overcast morning. I'm hoping the sun comes out a little bit later. And we'll see you all again for 3.30 game drive and a bushwalk activities. Thanks from myself and Steve, Owen, Morris, BK, everyone in FC. Let's have a most fabulous World Wildlife Day. <laughs>